Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is a review of the 1988 much maligned but incredibly underrated sequel, Critters 2, The Main Course. Now, to me personally, Critters 2 is on the same level as other underrated and overlooked sequels. Uh, it's on the same level as Predator 2, Robocop 2, The Fly 2, Gremlins 2, films that, for whatever reason, uh, did not do as well critically or financially as their predecessors. Uh, I don't understand why this film tanked in the box office. I don't understand why critics who liked the first film weren't as fond of the sequel. Uh, to me, it's every bit as enjoyable and entertaining as the first movie, and in some aspects is actually better than the first film. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, its effects, uh, the uh, spectacle uh, of the special effects, uh, and, and a few other elements here and there. In particular, the critters in this film have more of a mean streak than they do in the first movie. I'm not saying that they're slouches or, or they're wimps or anything in the first film, but there's definitely more, they're, they're more vicious here. There's more of a body count. Uh, there, and on top of that, you have some really ingenious creative stuff. Uh, so overall, I, I think this film is everything you want out of a sequel. It, it carries over elements from the first film that worked, but also brings in new elements. Uh, it, ha it, it ends up expanding the story and the overall lore. It doesn't feel like a total rehash or copy of the first movie with just a few different ingredients or different parts here and there. Uh, I, I don't get why people didn't come back for seconds. I don't understand why the same audience that gulped up Critters when it came out didn't come to the theater to see Critters 2. I, I, I don't, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I don't understand why the film was such a bomb. It cost $4 million and only made $3.8 million in the box office. It, it's, it's such a shame. Because, I mean, because of this film's uh, failure in the box office, New Line essentially relegated this franchise to direct-to-video. Uh, th th this was the end of, of theatrically released Critters films with bigger budgets. And that sucks. Really does. Uh, but, I mean, 1988 was full of films that, for whatever reason, didn't do that well. I mean, the Blob remake, one of my favorite films, one of, one of the best remakes of all time, that wasn't a big hit either. So, uh, it, it's just, for some reason, 88 was not really the best year uh, for horror films in terms of box office success, unless it was an already established franchise. A, a lot, There's a lot of films in 88 in this genre that for whatever reason just didn't do well. Uh, the film is directed by Mick Garris. It's his directorial debut and it's quite a debut. I mean, Mick Garris is a, a talented uh, guy uh, at this particular point in time. He was rising in Hollywood as a screenwriter, but he had the itch to direct and uh, he got the job uh, to direct this film. And, and what's, what's funny is, before he got the job for this, he was he was talking about how he didn't want his first film to be some effects heavy production, and fate would have it that his first film would be an effects heavy production. But because there were so many established veterans that were involved with the production, uh, it wasn't as difficult of a proposition for him, uh, and and. Uh, I, I also th feel that he was just 100% up to the challenge. He wanted the direct. He was like, here's my opportunity. I'm going to do it. Uh, and you can tell that this is uh, a, a uh, effort from, from a director who, even though didn't have a whole lot of experience directing feature films beforehand, is a guy that knows how to set things up. He knows how to work with his, with his actors he knows how to handle the elements. In particular, I mean, this film's production was, was freezing hell for people involved with the movie. 
Uh, this film was shot somewhere in California, and at the particular time, the, it, there were record cold temperatures. So this was a pretty miserable shoot for a lot of people involved. But despite that, uh, it wasn't as miserable as you think it would be. Like, I'm saying it's miserable, but it's only miserable in terms of the uh, weather. It wasn't a miserable shoot for people in terms of their... Uh, vibe in terms of uh how they were feeling because mick garris uh did a great job allowing everybody to have fun despite the fact that they're freezing their uh butts off and uh it was a pretty uh light production in terms of the energy and the tone and 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 the whole vibe of everything despite uh despite the circumstances um he did a equally as nice job working with uh, the camera and doing different things with the camera in terms of how certain shots were were set up and and so on and so forth. Worked well with the Kyoto brothers uh, and in a lot of ways just to let them do their own thing. So overall, I I, I thought it was just a really marvelous job by Mick Garris directing this film. Um, could not have asked for a, a, a better job directing wise. Also, Mick Garris is an, a very talented screenwriter, so he also lent his talents to uh, the screenplay. Uh, was, this the script is based on a treatment and initial screenplay by David Tui, uh, but Mick Garris came in and and punched some things up and changed some things around. I have the screenplay; it was gifted to me by a good friend of mine. And I read it, and it was a, it was a fun read. I would say there aren't a lot of whole a lot of giant differences between the script and the and the finished film. There are some things that were changed, uh, some lines of dialogue that were different or not used in in the final cuts. I think some of them were actually in the TV version. Some I actually would would not minded being left in the film. Others I'm like I could care less. Uh, but overall. Uh, it's it's a fun read if you if you can find it and you're a fan of critters uh it, it's it's worth checking out um but on, on the screenplay front i think this is a really solid script uh i i think it does a great job with the balance of horror and comedy which is not easy to do and just like the first film it does a very uh impressive job with that balance uh, Critters and Critters 2 make this balance look easy, and trust me, it's not. There's a lot of films out there that do not achieve this balance at all, and it shows, and it's to the detriment of the movie, but that's not the case here. And what's crazy is this movie has more of a zany vibe to it than the first film did, and I'm not saying the first film was like dead serious, but this has even more of a zany vibe and feel to it. There's a lot of moments here that seem like they're uh, out of a Looney Tunes cartoon. And that's intentional. That's what Mick Garris is going for. But despite that, it feels like it has more of a vicious mean streak, especially with the critters. Uh, there's the scene with the with the Easter Bunny, uh, who the, the, the poor guy gets critter balls in, in, in his in his pants and and get gets flung through the window at, at uh, the Easter church service and is just coughing up blood and just dead on the floor in front of everybody at, at, at the Easter service. Um, you have the whole stuff in the Hungry Heifer uh, um, restaurants. You have the whole sequence of the critter ball when it rolls over a guy and leaves behind a bloody skeleton. You know, there, there, there's more of a, a vicious edge and uh, intensity to, to the film and to especially to the sequences with the critters. This, and that easily could not have meshed well with this zany vibe, but the screenwriters, they make it work. I also feel that the script... It, it does a really nice job expanding the film's lore and especially with stuff involving Charlie and his relationship with the bounty hunters and uh, giving a little bit more for Brad to do in terms of his character, in terms of his growth, introducing new characters 
that are equally as strong as an interest and, and as interesting as others improving characters from the previous film. Like for instance, I think the character of Sheriff Harve is a better character in this film and in this screenplay than he is in the first movie. Uh, and on top of that, doing ingenious, original, new, unique stuff like the critter ball the uh, transformation of Lee, who transforms into a Playboy model, you know, stuff like that. So it's just really interesting, unique stuff. Um, it also has a really uh, fun sense of humor, some some really enjoyable, fun lines of dialogue, and uh, some fun uh, meta stuff too. Like for instance, uh, there's a sequence in the film where Lee is about to transform into Freddy Krueger because she's looking at a, a standee of Freddy. And that's a nice meta callback to a new line and, and, and the studio that released the film. And uh, it's always fun to see Fred. So it's just one of those things where it's just got a lot. The screenplay has a lot going for it. Uh, it has a nice explosive fun finale. Uh, that being said, I do have some issues with the script uh, mainly how they handle the character of Lee. It, the, the char the, how they handle the character of Lee is something that I love, but also something that I hate. I love how they do the progressive stuff with body fits and honestly throw in some transgender uh, uh, vibes and, and themes into this screenplay uh, for a creature feature, a sequel to a creature feature. Uh, that's something they didn't have to do. And you can tell that they're trying to go for something progressive because there's a line of dialogue where Ugg is talking about how Lee needs to find the right body fit. And then it seems that he f finds the right body fit when he turns into the Playboy model. So it seems like the right body fit for Lee is, is, is being a woman. So, I mean, that's an interesting uh, uh, message uh, and, and honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a good message, but then it honestly kind of undermines that message because there's a sequence where Lee turns into Eddie Deason. We didn't need that. For one, it's a horrifying image to see, uh, <laughs> Roxanne turned into Eddie Deason. Like that's, that's, that's a scarier or more disturbing sequence to me than any sequence with any of the critters. It's just not needed, not necessary, uh, and I'm not a big fan of Eddie Deason, period, so he was just there for like two minutes. Didn't need to be in the film, didn't need to have that sequence, um, and, on, and honestly it took away for some moments where you could have a little bit more character development, a little more scenes where Lee is, is really starting to really like the body that, uh, that he, that, uh, she's in and is, is really becoming more comfortable with it. Uh, eventually does the right thing. She turned, you know, Lee turns back into, uh, the, to Roxanne, the, the playboy model. But then the screenplay decides to kill her off, has her die in an alley getting eaten by a bunch of critters. And in some ways it's, it just it's just creating conflicting messages like it's progressive about body fit and then then it's kind of not and then she dies in an alley screaming like a uh, regular average slasher victim and it's just like it just felt like a, a huge missed opportunity and they're just I don't understand what they were going for. Like they're being progressive with the whole body fit thing. And and speaking of that, there's there's a line of dialogue in the original screenplay and in, in the T V cut that it should have just kept in. It's a sequence where Lee actually expresses and says body fit once uh uh he undergoes the transformation. Um I don't understand why the character gets killed off, especially not in that way. I'm fine with Lee dying, but have Lee die in a noble sacrifice. Instead of having Charlie sacrifice himself by smashing this, the spaceship into the critter ball, like have Lee do that. Have Charlie do something else. 
uh, or, or have him on the spaceship and Lee is the one that decides to crash the spaceship and Charlie survives, you know, stuff like that. You didn't have to kill off Lee in that particular fashion. Uh, that's, that's really the major thing that I don't really care for when it comes to this screenplay. But overall, still a solid script, despite uh, that particular issue that I do have with it. Uh, speaking of solid, is a solid cast. Good cast. Scott Grimes is back as Brad. Uh, I, th- I thought he did a really good job with the, with the, with the performance. It, it's, it's nice to see that same energy, that same enthusiasm that he had with the character uh, in the first film present here in the sequel you can tell that that uh, scott was really glad to be a part of, of the production he was really happy to do another one and uh it, it's really too bad that the film did so bad because in a lot of ways it it, it hurts scott grimes's career it hurt his career uh he didn't go on to do a whole lot after this he did a film called nightlife which is incredibly underrated and i would recommend checking out if you haven't already uh, really a fun, uh, a lot of ways, a zombie movie. But after that, it just wasn't, he just, his career didn't take off. And it's just, it's just a, it's just a shame in, in a lot of ways. But he did a good job here with, with the character. Uh, still had the same uh, spunk and same energy and, and same likable personality that, that his character had. Uh, when he was younger and and present in the first film, uh, there are some newcomers to the cast and uh, Leanne Alexander Curtis, who plays Megan Morgan, really liked her. I thought she, honestly, I would say she's the best actress that I that I, that I saw in the franchise. Uh, I I just I just loved her vibe. I loved her energy. Uh, I thought she had just some really wonderful chemistry with everyone in the cast, especially Scott Grimes and, uh, really in, in enjoyed her. She was cute. Uh, but you could also buy that she could hold her own. So big win for me in terms of, uh, a newcomer for to the franchise. Uh, Terrence Mann is back as Ugg does another, uh, s- solid job with the character here he has a little bit more uh, to work with in terms of showing his um, range. There's a, a a really good sequence where he shows his frustration and anger at the loss of of Lee, um, but at the same time, could have had that scene a little bit later, and not not in the way that it, that it was uh, set up in, in initially in the script, and it would be equally as effective, if not even more so. Um, Really liked the way that Sheriff Harv was written. Uh, much more likable character. Even when he's being a crudmudgeon and being kind of a jerk early on in the film and like quitting and like trying to run away. Uh, he still had some really fun lines of dialogue. And then he has this moments near the end where he's a badass. Shoots up some critters with, with uh, two sh- six shooters. So uh, honestly a massive improvement over the character in the first film. Uh, Don Opper once again does a really good job with with his performance as Charlie. Um, he has more to work with here. The character is more established. The character has more development, so that enables uh, Don to really play with this character more, and it shows. Um, there are other actors and actresses that are part of the cast. I mean, Tom Hodges who plays Wesley, good bully, but also has some moments where. You know, he has a has a nice, nice uh, humility to him, and and, and there's something about about uh, the performance and the character where you're like, maybe he's not such a bad guy. Uh, but it was fun to see him. I remember him the most as Lars in Heavyweights, uh, but it, it was fun to see him in, in this movie. Uh, Sam Anderson plays Mr. Morgan. Lindsay Parker plays Cindy. They're they're all there. Uh, Lynn Shea is back as her character Sal from the first film. She has a lot of fun uh, energy moments where she's just lively and 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 uh, just really into it. Uh, Roxanne uh, Kernahan she plays Lee uh, once Lee transforms. 
uh, it's spe speaking of transforms, that sequence is a great effect. It's a really great effect by uh, the visual effects artists. And it's a really great example of thinking on your feet because it, it was not exactly the way that they had planned. They were going to use bladders, but then something happened with the bladders and it didn't work. So they had to come up with something on the fly and it was still an effective uh, sequence in terms of the transformation. That sequence is jaw dropping in so many different ways. For one, it's a great looking effect. Two, it's got full frontal nudity and you just bare ass shots. Like how the hell did this get past the censors? I mean, even people involved with this movie, they are, they had said in the documentary, they're like, I don't even know how it got past the NBA. I don't know either. Maybe the guy who was looking at the film to see whether or not it, it, it uh, passes standards. Maybe he saw Roxanne's tits and was like, Oh my God, those tits are amazing. Like pass it on through. Like, I, I don't, I don't understand how a PG-13 film, even in 1988, wound up getting uh, all of this nudity past the censors. I'm not going to complain. I mean, I'm totally fine with it, but it's a totally mind-boggling thing. It really is. Um, but anyway, uh, speaking of Roxanne, I thought the performance wasn't anything particularly amazing, but I'm not going to be too hard on her because of two reasons. For one, she wasn't cast for her acting ability. And this character didn't need to have some Oscar worthy, I mean, Oscar, excuse me, Oscar worthy uh, performance. That wasn't necessary for this particular role. She was cast because they were looking for a particular appearance, particular look. They wanted to find a Playboy model, but I don't think any Playboy models were wanting to do the movie. So they found Roxanne, who had done a Playboy spread, but it wasn't actually included. Uh, but Playboy still had the spread, even though they didn't include it in any of the magazines. So they were able to use it in the film. And uh, so she was a fledgling actress. She was just starting her career. So she fit the mold that they were looking for and she did a good job of what she was asked to do. If, if the screenplay gave her more to do, I think she might've done an even better job, but she did a good job with, with what she was given. Uh, also she was such a trooper. I mean, that sequence where she's topless and, and shows her ass like that is a scene where she was doing that in like freezing cold weather. So, um, and, and she just really, did it, didn't really complain, didn't, you know, toughed it out. And, you know, hey, I mean, that that's 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 something that deserves a lot of credit. Um, sadly, and this is the second point why I'm not going to be too hard on her. She didn't really have a whole lot of uh, time to uh, hone her craft or to uh, improve because sadly she passed away in an accident. I think only a couple or a few years after the release of this movie. So her, her career and her life was cut short. So um, out of respect to her, I, I'm just going to say I wasn't super impressed with it. But for what she was asked to do, did a fine job. Um, and may she rest in peace. So I didn't mean to put a damper on things, but you know. That's the reality of the situation. That That's what happened with Roxanne, sadly. Um, there are other aspects of this production that are that are worth mentioning. Uh, the Kyoto Brothers, once again, uh, do a remarkable and astonishing job with the, uh, with the critters' effects. They created more critters, uh, even though it only had a million dollars more than the budget for the, for the first film. But here they are. They come in. They create even more critters that do even more crazy things. They uh, do some stuff for real that is still really impressive, like the the, the uh, huge uh, stampede of critters uh, that's rolling around on the on, on the ground in succession with one another. That was all done for real. Nowadays, this is kind of stuff they probably do for CGI, but they thought of stuff on the fly. Uh, while they were working on the movie to use practical uh, tools to create the effect. And it's, it's just a really impressive looking effect. The Critter Ball, I mean, 
not only is that a great idea, one of the best ideas, if you ask me in this kind of movie, uh, it's iconic, uh, but they had different uh, critter balls that they tested, and, and there, there's one that's used for shots where it's just rolling around uh, that just has some pelts on it but doesn't have any faces. But there's another one that actually had articulated critter faces that would move around and like mouths would move and eyes would blink and stuff like that. I, I, it's just unbelievable. Absolutely 100% unbelievable. All the Kyoto brothers and all the uh, puppet guys and all the people who worked on the film, uh, they deserve uh, high marks and high fives. They did a, an absolutely uh, amazing job with, with the, with the critters in this movie and with the effects. Um, but it doesn't stop there with the critter effects, the visual effects guys, the guys who did the transformation sequence with Lee, the uh, other effects like the explosions, uh, the, the stunt work, all uh, deserve equally as high marks. Um, and I honestly really like the score by Nicholas Pike. I think it's a great score. I think he did a really bang up job with the score for this film. I actually think it's overall, it's an improvement over the score from the first film, despite the fact that I really like the Critter Skitter by David Newman. Overall, I think the score by Nicholas Pike uh, across the board is an improvement over, over the, over the first film. I think, I really think it has a great epic feel to it. In some ways it kind of reminds me of the score for life force. Uh, the editing is excellent by Charles Bornstein. Uh, the film has some really nice cinematography by Russell Carpenter. And it only has like a running time of 85 minutes. It goes by at a really quick pace. It rolls by fast, furry, and furious. Um, and like I said, it does what you want out of a sequel. It delivers the goods when it comes to doing something different and to giving you uh, something that you haven't seen before. And, but still carrying over the same ingredients and the same elements that work so well in the first film. Uh, I personally feel Critters 2 is an excellent sequel and, and definitely one of the one of the best films of its type uh, alongside the first film. Uh, great Blu-ray 2. Uh, it looks great. Uh, Sound-wise, it sounds fantastic. I, I'm wondering if there's something going on with the sound mix for the first movie like the sound mix isn't terrible by any means but it doesn't sound as loud and as um uh, full as the sound mix for uh, critters 2 um i also have to give a lot of uh praise for the the, the uh, special features on this blu-ray great uh making of documentary about the making of the film with interviews with uh Leanne Curtis with Don Opper, Terrence Mann, Lynn Shea, Mick Garris, the Kyoto Brothers. Um, and there's a lot of uh, details that I mentioned in, in this particular uh, review that I learned from that documentary. And there's extra ones, too, that I didn't mention. Uh, so definitely worth watching if, if you're a fan of the film or if you just saw the movie and you want to see more about how they did it. Uh, overall, I, I highly recommend Critters 2, uh, the main course. Uh, if you are looking for a fun creature feature, uh, definitely check this one out if you haven't already. And, uh, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about the film, except it, it just, it really does suck that this didn't do well, uh, in, in financially and, and not only for the Critters franchise, but for New Line Cinema because uh, apparently New Line was in line to get a huge investment from a big time investor in terms of uh, funding. And uh, th uh, Bob Shea took him to the premiere of Critters 2 and it was a somber, sad night because there was like nobody in line and there was barely anybody in the theater. And it was just such a bad first impression to this investor that he, he pulled out. He pulled out and, and New Line lost out on a huge chunk of change, which they could have used to stay open uh, and, and do other projects maybe. 
I mean, New Line would still be alive after Critters 2, despite its uh, financial failure. But, you know, who knows? That might have helped them keep their doors open even longer. But uh, regardless, uh, to me, it's a fun, entertaining, uh, quite... Uh, enjoyable and underrated sequel that uh, I'm really glad that it's ultimately gotten the uh, praise that I personally feel it deserves. Uh, but at the same time, I feel it deserved that the moment that it rolled into the years. But anyway, thank you for watching my review of Critters 2, the main course. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.